Hello everyone, welcome to I Today Apero number six. So uh, I'm so happy to welcome uh, all of you live with us tonight. This is great. So maybe, you know, I'm just gonna switch the camera. And hey everyone, can you say hi to the camera? Yeah! <laughs> Thank you so much for joining live, like, like really, because You know, like we are uh, in uh, Lausanne City, Switzerland. It's super sunny today, so mm. we are competing against the sun. And I'm so happy to see everyone, you know, who is uh, live with us. Uh, so this is great. And so it, uh, it's I today apero, mm. and uh, maybe you don't know what an apero is. Uh, so an apéro in Switzerland or France is kind of like a tradition and it's a good time, you know, when you drink a glass of wine with friends, it's casual, so it's a relaxed conversation and it's all about, you know, technology and innovation, but also wine. So uh, we have a little tradition at I to the apéro, uh, which is this one. Um, Our amazing speaker of today, so we have two speakers today, Nicolas Anchot and uh, Valentin Calam, uh, will get each of them one bottle of white wine, it's Viognier, <laughs> because Nicolas likes Viognier, so this is what you, uh, you're going to get. Uh, also, we're going to send one bottle of wine to one of you in the room who is uh, asking uh, some of the best questions or shows a lot of interest or interacts uh, in the chat. So it's going to be uh, the choice of Nicolas and Valentin to choose who is going to be the lucky winner. And we are crazy. We send the wine worldwide, uh, except in Estonia, because last time we realized uh, we had a speaker from Estonia, Annette Numa. We tried to send her the wine and it's forbidden to send wine in Estonia for some reason. So she got some chocolate. But uh, if you don't live in Estonia, you're going to get the wine, which is a very, very good you right um i'm so happy today to uh welcome uh two very uh, interesting people from epfl ecal lab so nicolas ancho is the director of epfl ecal lab and valentin calam is a researcher uh, from this lab so um we ha also have stephanie kudremorou from the swiss national library and we have the team of aptitude sa uh, who was in charge of creating this uh, crazy website that you're going to discover that is more than a website it's more like a platform uh, to expose the the work of uh, uh, Jean Starobinsky, which is one of the most famous Swiss author. And you will see it's a very interesting project with, uh, it's an exhibition online from analog documents uh, on paper. So um, it's basically 40,000 documents that uh, eventually will be uh, showcased on this platform. And it, it, it's, it's just a crazy work. It's a 14 month project and they won uh, several awards with this project uh, last year. It was released a couple of months ago. So uh, really I'm very excited Uh, to welcome Nicolas Ancho today and Valentin Calam to tell us everything about this great project, Jean Starobinsky Relation Critique. Please, everyone, I would like a big round of applause for Nicolas Ancho and Valentin Calam, please. <laughs> yes, welcome to A Today Apéro. Many thanks, uh, Steph. So I, I have already a bottle of, of Europe. I know it's, it's for your family uh, one, so, so I have already one. But you know, I'm sitting just on the other side of the of the city, so it's where we have the UNESCO winery. So if I don't want to be killed by the winemaker just around me next, I have another one, so I can have from both sides, you know. Um, so it, it sounds you know, perhaps not so rational to have, you know, this this difference between so tiny places, but But as human, you know, we're not very rational people, I think, and and that's perhaps the, the beauty. So uh, I will show you uh, for this this talk. I'll start this talk about augmented relations. Uh, it's uh, related to the relation critique, the the title of the exhibition. But here we try to augment the what what we we say. I will start with this unrational uh, part of of Switzerland, and perhaps you will see that it goes something that you will see in other places in, in the world. Um, so let's start with one specific number. Uh, uh, I start with this number, 1550.14. Probably only the Swiss, who are a bit older, like, like, like me, know what it is. That was a Swiss votation in 2009 about the Swiss passport, uh, biometric passport. You know, in Switzerland, we vote on, on, on almost everything. Uh, every two months, we have votation. And There was a votation about do we accept the biometric passport and people almost refused it uh, that was why because they were afraid that the confederation the swiss government will have the three fingerprints the size uh, and the color of your eyes and your gender um, at the same time they were already putting everything on the on the social network um, so say oh at that time 
uh, people were a bit stupid or they didn't know uh, much about the this digital world. Uh, so what happened 10 years later? Uh, we have the Swiss COVID app, uh, a state in Switzerland, um, where it allows to detect if you were in the, next to somebody who has the COVID. And again, big fight because the confederation could have some data. In fact, it's totally decentralized. Uh, that's, uh, so it's it's probably more a technical problem to get really impact rather to to, uh, um, to have an issue with the data. So big fight, political fight against this with COVID because perhaps some uh, data could be, uh, you could be tracked in way or another. At the same time, people continue to put, for instance, there's one company that owns medical um, doctors, uh, bank, and a big supermarket chain, and they can co collect all the data together. And here, no problem. So see, Again, people are not rational. Swiss are not rational. I don't know how it is in your country, but so I know you can say, oh, people are totally stupid. So let's try just to sell our stuff and, and, and run uh, as fast as possible afterwards. Or you can say, ah, perhaps it's the beauty of the thing. It's we people are emotional people are uh, working with a cultural context. They have some different perception. And and I think this is really what we try to do. It's why I created this lab called the EPFL EK Lab, which is the design research lab of EPFL, uh, one of the two Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, the one based in Lausanne. And, and basically what we try to do is, is to see how we can bring, uh, we can turn technical performance into uh, a convincing user experience. So it's why we have here not only designers, we have designers, but we have also engineers, we, and we have psychologists. It's, and the psychologists are not there to, to, to control the fight between the two first. It, it's more to see how we can observe, can, how we can understand the impact of, of technology, of the user experience. And basically, it's how we can turn really this technology into user experience or usage, and then give them an expression, and then understand what are the key factor of uh, adoption. You see that there's been a lot of technology coming, you know, like 3D TV and other stuff like this. Fantastic promises. Google Glass, ah, oh, great. So you can put your things in your, so, okay, and what kind of content? What is the impact on the relation between people? Big problem. So uh, we, we try to work on this issue because we think that it will be positive for the user, but also for the company, because when you invest a lot of money and you see at the end that it's not accepted that, and you even don't know why, then you lose really a lot because you, you, you lose your money, you lose your motivation, and you even don't know why people didn't uh, uh, understand your proposition. So I will show you some of the topics that we're working on now just before I start with the um, uh, uh, Starobinsky exhibition, but I'll start with this one. You know, we, we have been working now for many years on inclusive uh, technologies. And when we started on this, a lot of people say, oh, you want to work with elderly people? It's nice, you know, and you can have some project, but at the end, in 10 years, every, everything will be solved because people will be aware about uh, digital uh, tools and, and it's okay. And in fact, it's totally wrong. And I can even tell you today that if you want to innovate and to be successful, don't work in the digital world, don't work with the millennials, work with the oldies. And why? Because in fact, they are just liars, you know? When they say, oh no, I don't understand, it's too complicated for me. For more than 92% of them, it's wrong. Because we, we made tests and we have a, a full platform dedicated to the organization of events among LED people. We earned several awards with this. It has been also nominated at the Design Award um, in Switzerland. Uh, and, and we have more than 3,000 events organized by LED people. And in fact, when we compare with uh, regular tools, in fact, they can do it. Just when they say, oh, I cannot, it's just because they don't want to spend time uh, and spend effort with something that they think is not credible, not trustful, and that will not have enough impact in their real life. And that's really the point. And so when you are able to overcome this quite strong expectation, uh, knowing also that the first punks they're getting in the 70s, so, so you have quite a huge diversity among <laughs> these people, um, in fact, and you put this in the hands of, of younger people, they say, wow, that's cool because it's so efficient, but as a culturally also efficient, you know, going into my real life, having real impact, that's, that works really well. Um, so we were able to understand how we can change your perception and uh, of, of the conception of all these devices and, and tools and, and perhaps addresses, address it from the 
user point of view and understand perhaps better what are really the barrier to adoption. Another one that we also work quite a lot and it's related to this is it's about trust. You know, in media, <clears throat> in fact, trust is the first factor in the business of media. And that's not what I say. I used to be a journalist, but <clears throat> it's, it's really what the uh, um, World Association of News Editors says. It's the first uh, factor for uh, success in, in media business. But when you start to aggregate different type of content, social network, um, uh, archives, um, also what media produce the journalist, you need to have artificial intelligence. Without this, it's, it's getting very difficult also because you have a lot of data. But then you create you know, some association that threats a bit the trust. So how you can give transparency, how you can give trust again in these tools, it's not so obvious. And we made a lot of tests with uh, different media magazines and, and we see here is also some immersive installations and we see how you can show this kind of transparency is is a critical topic for for the future but most of in the investment right now are done into how you can detect the uh, fake news for instance create algorithm and algorithm and algorithm which is good by the way but then if you that you're just creating creating re reliability with this i mean you have less mistakes but how does the reader or the user understand that it's more reliable? Uh, the trust is really the human perception of what you produce and not just the accuracy of what you produce. And this is something which is absolutely not studi studied or very, very rarely. And it's at the end, what makes the value uh, that you can monetize. Uh, so it's not only about the quality of the information, but also about the business behind and things are going together. So <clears throat> all this kind of experimentation serves and you see here part of the archives, something uh, which is really close to my heart, how we can revive all this heritage. You know, we have digitized everything, uh, uh, not everything, but a lot of stuff. Invest a lot of money, how we can turn all this documents, movies and thing into digital uh, support and accessible from anywhere. And that's good. But then how do you revive this? Uh, how, how you create an experience which is meaningful with all this heritage. And in many places, we see that people have spent a lot of money uh, to this, and then just a few researchers go and, and, and use this content. And we think that it's really important to, to use this kind of stuff. So uh, you'll see here, there's one, yeah, that's one of the picture. We, we were working with the Montreux Jazz uh, um, Festival. You see here, for instance, a very immersive uh, mobile environment where we can revive the concerts in, in a way that it creates also some emotional relation between the people, create something with the environment and, and work on a new concept of, of mobility. You can travel in time and in, in, in distance. So when uh, two years ago, a bit more than two years ago, uh, Stéphanie cudre moreau head of the um, uh, Archive Littéraire Suisse, Suisse uh, uh, Archive, Literary Archive came to me, said, oh, no, we would love to make an exhibition on Pierre Star Starobinsky, I said, uh, but we want to make a digital ex exhibition and say, oh, that, that's really great news because we used to know each other. We launched uh, a quite a big collection of, of books uh, many years ago and say, oh, that, that's great. But what do you really want to do? Because, okay, Jean Starobinsky, and I check, in fact, really what Jean Starobinsky wrote about. And, you know, I knew his name, and in fact, it's the most uh, well known, most famous critique of the 20th century. He's really the guy who bring most of the knowledge about critique. And he was not only a theorist of critique, he was also um, a scientist, he was also a medical doctor, he was also uh, a musician, he, he just an incredible philosopher. So he had 45,000 books at home. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so he's really a Swiss author, but that has a incredible reach out in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the world. And when he speaks about critique, say that, you know, I'm using critique every day with uh, Valentin, with all my stuff, with my kids at home, with, well, almost everybody. Uh, and other people do the same. Uh, so uh, do I know something about critiques? No, in fact, I, I never study and I, I don't know. Uh, something about critique and I do it every day, that's a bit bad. So I, I'm doing something and I have absolutely no knowledge. So it's, it's important that we share this knowledge among us so that we improve perhaps our life and our relation to the, to the other. 
So that's a good example of a seal of knowledge that exists and that is not shared with the other. So I came back to Stephanie and said, oh, okay, but how do we engage with this document? How we can recreate uh, a storytelling in a new way? We, we don't know how to do this uh, uh, in the digital world. So it's it's more a research project to to reach your goal than just an, um, an exhibition online because in fact, the basis to, to create it doesn't exist really. And, uh, and she said, okay, uh, that, that's, you, you're right, we, we have to do this, but I need to have an exhibition on November 23rd. And say, oh, but I'm, I'm a research lab, I cannot commit for something online. And then we said, okay, yeah, here you see Jean Starobinsky uh, with, a, with his, always his smile and, and, and just incredible face. Uh, uh, and, and you can think about the richness of, of, of this guy and, and so important to share uh, this past and, and his all what is produced and it's by the way really useful today now um, so to come back to the story said okay we'll try to get this uh, uh online but we need to find a, a third partner uh, here uh it, it's really important that we get somebody who can with whom we can work so that we do research and we do the production at the same time and that's something yeah usually you do four years of research and then you you have your PhD and you give this to a company and it takes uh, forever to, to produce something. And here we said, we need to find a partner, but a new type of partner. And so we made a call and it's where Aptitude came in. Uh, they won the call, but they won the call because they were not only sitting uh, in, in our neighborhood on this EPFL campus, uh, which is by the way, quite uh, nice and impressive. So we had this proximity. I think this is really important because we could sit together. We like digital tools, but at a certain time when we're about creation, about sharing sentiments, looking at documents, I think it's important to be together. So this proximity in Switzerland is, is something important that we had, but also because they were able to rethink the relation uh, of a company into an innovation project. Mm. I think it was really an incredible journey uh, because they were coming with their expertise in applied design, in technology and say, okay, we, we can understand the research, we know how to produce the thing, we have also the national library on the, on the other side, and together we can create something and it reinvents the way how we collaborate so that we find perhaps a new type of innovation process where we can produce research and real content online uh, uh, that can be applied. And for the research, it's not bad. Why? Because you can retest uh, your results of what you're producing with real people in real life uh, mm. condition. And I think this is, has a really, really great um, uh, value. So that, that was really the, the background, how we started the, the whole venture. And uh, I think it was not easy for sure because we need to understand our skills coming from different worlds. Uh, and <laughs> I must say this partnership was really important because at the end, what was also important is the involvement of the Bibliothèque Nationale and the uh, um, Swiss Literary Archive, because uh, Stephanie Cudery Moreau and her team and all the photographers around her for the documents, and they really bring the knowledge about the content. At the end, it's what we want to valorize and not just our fa fancy design and anything like that. So, so it's important to be all around the table and to be able to discuss together. But now I will give the word to um, Valentin, uh, who's working with uh, with uh, me um, and uh, Romain Colo. Romain Colo follows also us. He's the um, artistic director of the of the project and also um, the project manager. But you know, as usually in the lab, it's really the the, the researcher and the research assistant doing their uh, thesis on, on this that redo the whole work yeah, and they're often at the back. So it's, it's really nice to have you with us, Valentin. You have a background in architecture and you came here to work more in kind of digital spaces. And I will let you perhaps present a bit more of the project itself and, and describe some some very specific feature that we try to involve in this in this project. Uh, thank you, Nicolas, for the introduction. Uh, the sound is okay? Perfect, Valentin. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry. And by the way, sorry for the French accent. Uh, it's difficult for me to... It's to charming. Be... It's charming. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I will just play a um, little clip that show a bit uh, the collaboration that we had with the three actors, uh, National Library, Ipefeleca Lab, and Aptitude. If it's... Then, oh, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, so yes, uh, as Nicolas said, uh, I'm an architect from EPFL and I'm currently doing a mass, uh, Master of Advanced Studies at EPFL Ecolab. And today I wanted to share with you my particular position to be in one end the designer and in the other end the researcher. And I will try to show you how these two worlds could or should be codependent in uh, the design process. Uh, to start a research like this, you have two kinds of sources of inspiration. First, you look at different uh, peer review papers that fit different subjects related to the field of the brief. For example, for this project, we were interested in paper dealing with the relationship between human and digital artifacts. And we extract uh, some concepts from them. For example, the poetic of digital historical object, the, re the relation between virtual and material object, and more abstract concept of materiality like aura and authenticity. And secondly, we use uh, references and intuition to start collecting ideas. Uh, talking about intuition, we quickly realized that the navigation was going to be a central focus. It seemed obvious to us that the visit proposed to the visitor could not be a single straightforward one. Because in terms of organization in physical museums, spaces are divided by architectural features, such as wall and columns. And this influences how the curator organize and group artifacts to establish a concept or a team for the, exhibit, for the visitor. And this special layout often builds a narrative for the visitor and establish relationship between different artifacts and the exhibition as a whole. However, the possibility of linking different artifacts and multi-narrative patterns remain limited to their physical presence, where each artifact can only exist in a single context or, or room of the exhibition. In digital exhibition, however, these constraints uh, do not apply, opening a large number of options for the organization of the document. After much reflection, we therefore imagine this exhibition as a set of consultation or reading spaces that would be arranged according to the visitor wishes. During his visit, the visitor could follow the proposed past or escape from it to create his own narrative. Our idea was to create, uh, was to consider each document as sort of a crossroads from which uh, several sec reading sequences would be possible. Uh, to understand how many choices or options we need to provide to the visitor for him to feel at the same time the influence of the creation to be able to extract a number of concepts from the exhibition and feeling control of his own experience. We develop a set of two prototypes with Figma. Uh, Figma is a UI design tool that you might know, but Figma was really a cool tool that we, uh, that we use a lot during the design process because it's really easy to get almost the same feeling as a coded interface really quick. And at the same time, it's easy to collaborate with different actors of the project. For example, in our case, we use Figma as an exchange platform between us and Aptitude to share the different interaction, discuss about organization of the content in the pages, and it's really allow us to have a bidirectional communication through this program and find technical and UX solution from our two entities. Uh, and of course, it was easy to share the results from this reflection and test them from the visitor point of view. So from these two prototypes, we run some tests with two types of participants, uh, some experts and interested in the field, 10 from each group, in order to extract what were the different expectations from these two public. Uh, in, this, in this process, our goal was to get some quantitative data, uh, do not only serve for the research, but mainly to continue the design process with some interesting input from the participants. We also use some qualitative data to support our decision. Uh, the result of the system look like this. It's a three axis navigation. Each one corresponds to a narrative of the exhibition. You have the principal one in the center, which is the thematic. One on your left, which is the typological one. And finally, on your right, you have the chronological one. But it's not three separate story. You can see from the color link in the diagram that everything is in a way interconnected. Indeed, the visitor will have at some moment of his navigation the choice of transgressing this system to link the different narrative. Um, so our visitor would then be immersed in his visit in a perpetual movement without ever being confronted with a dead end. And our idea here was to encourage maximum engagement and concentration on the part of the visitor or in other words, to get him into a state of flow, him or her, sorry, into a state of flow. And this concept of state of flow comes from literature. Uh, I won't go too much into the detail of this concept 
but you should know that it's a kind of altered state of consciousness which you get when you are totally absorbed in a task. And that's precisely what we are trying to offer to the visitor. An environment like the web is really supportive for this kind of state, thanks to the interactivity, the fact that you interact with content and you are in control of your own experience helps a lot, but it's not enough. The navigation system should also bring some unexpected outcome and at the same time be in a fluent movement in the exploration process. So this is one of the key concepts of the exhibition. Uh, the visitor will be able to recontextualize the document in front of them or to choose a proposed sequence of reading. So it is up to them to create their own narrative or let themselves be guided. As I said before, every document can become a crossword. So about the perception of the document, uh, one of the specificities of this project is that we were included in the process of reflection for the digitalization of this artifact. It's really a chance for us to get really qualitative digitalization, but also a big challenge to understand how we can improve the relationship between a visitor and a digital artifact through this process of captation. So for that, we read about some different concepts like the dilemma of the copy, aura of a digitalized uh, artifact, sorry, authenticity and materiality. Yes, because we all know that the matter does not exist in the digital world. However, the materiality exists because it's only the matter of perception. So we then started our, collaborate, our collaboration with the Reprography Workshop of the National Library. The photographer put the, the experiences at the service of this new context. But our objective was not only to produce the numerous images of our exhibition, but also to define photographic parameters that would reinforce the materiality and legibility of the documents. So it was a real applied experiment that we conduced with them. Each type of document was photographed by varying a parameter each time. So the parameter was like the type of light, the light angle, the distance of the reflector, the vividness uh, of the images, the white balance, and the exposure. And that for each type of document. So this setting will be applied in different ways, depending on the type of the document in question. Uh, we will indeed have different settings for a sheet of paper, a pile of letter, a notebook, or even a bulky book. And to, refund, to reinforce the tangible aspect of uh, a document, we mainly played with the light, the angle of the shot, or maybe a bit with the color atmosphere. And we realized, for example, that a low angle of light would bring out more relief, such as written mark or other sign of wear. This is normally what we are trying to avoid in a classical digitalization. When you think about a scanner, the light comes from the top, and we discover that you lose a lot of information, especially about uh, the volume. So it's also a way to consider this kind of flat document as an object with the volumetric features. As we can see it in this uh, letter of uh, Nicolas Bouvier for Jean Starbinsky, you will have seen that most of the documents are photographed from the front as if they were placed on a table or displayed in a case. The main reason is that it's the best way to enjoy the content for the visitor. On the other hand, we wanted to highlight some specific artifacts that we call emblematic documents. We therefore decided to treat them in a more specific way, in a, with more committed, even more experimental photographic gear. The example of the screen shows that the angle of the shot and the vanishing point have been exaggerated, as for the light, in order to highlight the iconic side of this object. The difficulty here was to make these two series of images coherent in terms of uh, atmosphere. So uh, when you see the specific angle used for this emblematic document, allow an interesting hierarchy within the cluster and between the document themselves. It is understood that this document does represent the cluster by its central position as well by the angle of view. Here, for example, it's a specific document, a collage letter from Michel Butor that have definitely interesting volumetric feature. Okay. The last point I wanted to discuss with you is the notion of augmentation. And by augmentation, we mean going beyond the simple reproduction of an object, for example, by transmitting more association to the visitor. This is an absolutely fundamental concept when dealing with questions such as how to transmit the value of the document to the visitor, or how do we tell them about the volume or the mass. In classical museum experience, artifacts tend to be conserved, preserved, and protected. 
limiting potential interaction for visitors. A digital exhibition, on the other hand, open up possibility for new interaction. Actually, some paper argue that combining virtual and abstract information with multimodal sensory experiences creates a new type of representation. They state that this characteristic of tangility provides easier access to new knowledge and spaces that are, that are more natural for, and, and effective for humans. It was at this point that we began our intensive collaborative work with the agency aptitude. The question was to evaluate which emerging digital technology were capable of creating a new layer of a new layer of interaction with the content and thus to further increase the visitor involvement in the learning process. So aptitude developed early in the process a platform that allow everyone involved in the project to test these different new actions with the content and bring feedbacks to continue to look for improvement. Uh, this platform was very mobile during the design process and provide to the entire team a space to test and discuss some principle like the scale of the document, the visual reaction to the weight, uh, the mass, the friction, the magnitude, background testing and shadow testing. Because at some point we wondered if the shadow has to be drawn by manually draw, draw or if it's okay if it's auto-generating. So this is an example of a small poster in the exhibition situation. Um, when you over the documents, it's like you are grabbing cool. the document and it's, it's isolating itself from the others and the movement here give you information about its weight and the shadow give us the information about the volume. So, um, and now uh, this is what we have produced and delivered. It is currently available online, and, but now in order to measure what are the impact of this experience, we are currently testing this version to determine the potential improvement in terms of user experience. But not only that, also to determine if our navigation concept have really provide a cognitive gain, a state of flow, and a higher level of engagement from the visitor. Uh, together with the psychologist in our team, we decided to make a second version of the exhibition that corresponds more to a classical exhibition navigation system that are currently available online. And this second version features exactly the same document in order to be able to compare the different results from the test of these two versions. So we also decided to test the perception of the document within this test, uh, because it seems quite obvious that you use image as navigation for an exhibition, but actually it's not the case for the literacy exhibition at the moment. So in general, the goal of this test is to generate knowledge about a new online curation and provide parameters in terms of multi-narrative navigation and also document perception. So in order to be able to apply this for future iteration, as for example, for a new author of the National Library. So yeah, thank you for your attention. And I give uh, the, mic, the mic back to Nicola. Yes, perhaps. <laughs> so perhaps just to, to conclude, you see that we, we spend about three months for this testing. And when I tell this to some, some partners or some other people, I say, but you're crazy, three months to test the thing. I say, yes, but usually in engineering, you spend much more time. Um, and, and why, when you start to understand what are the human percept, you should spend less time. And human are quite complex. It's the, the richness of the human. And I think it's very important that we understand this. What are these key factors of, of ex, uh, acceptance? And sometimes we think, oh, we just got an award. And, and, and the, the incredible stuff with this project is that we, we went online on time thanks to, to Aptitude. I mean, they, it was quite hard at the end, I must say, <laughs> but they managed to be on time, 23rd November, reliable, and we had this. And the same day, we got an award, a mail the web, and three nominations. So, so it's, we can say that it was really an incredible performance. But at, at the end, what will really show us the success is do people really understand something from, from what we have shown? Do they increase the cognitive uh, uh, load with this? Do they really enjoy it? Do they engage with this? And can we have some principle that we can apply to many other exhibitions to valorize all this richness that we have on the web? I think this is what is really the question about, but it's also important, uh, as I said before, to have 
also people that check we about the content because we can play with a lot of different you know narrative stuff if the content is not really well created uh, and and i know that for um uh, for stephanie it was about she, they visit about 600 boxes in the archives uh, uh, several thousands of documents, I think 100,000 documents. So all this creation was also something very important and that will remain. So it, it doesn't replace the creator. It's just something that allows to valorize all, all this digital content. So I, I think that we we will share with you in, in a few months uh, with the end of the, the research project of Valentin, the results on this and, and hopefully give you some tips, hints to see how you can create a really meaningful uh, exhibition online helped also to build this, this knowledge together. And also that we can create this new innovation path where we can combine research and production uh, simultaneously, as I said, to have impact in the real world and not just to publish between experts, but to have to keep this publication uh, aspect, to have really strong, solid knowledge and at the same time to have uh, impact for social uh, for our daily life and, and we all the, the, the people around us. I think this is what is our goal here. So thank you again also, Steph, for, for the organization and we're happy to, to answer some questions here. Amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Nicola and, uh, and, um, and Valentin. Uh, please, everyone, I would like first a big round of applause for our speakers. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. The, the, the first question I'm... Basically, I have a question. It's for Valentin. You are an architect by trade. Uh, how did it help you? You know, like this is a massive UX project. Uh, the whole navigation is something I've never seen before. Um, yeah. How did you, I, I assume that you use your skills of an architect to, to build that. Can you tell us like, you know, what are the relations between, uh, yeah, like your, like your background in architecture and what you did during this project? Uh... It's a difficult one. Uh, I think it's Sorry. it's. <laughs> uh, uh, I read that the curator thinks about the um, spaces that you use for exhibition as the first matter for an exhibition. So I think it could be. It was for me a, a super cool, uh, comment dire, uh, super cool um, topic to think about an exhibition without any constraint. Like it's really easy, but. It was difficult to see when you have constraints. It's easy to to find solution. Like uh, you, you can. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's kind of easy for an architect to do this kind of uh, space in uh, virtual. Okay, um, but did you have already a lot of experience in digital projects, or was it kind of like a, like something new for you coming from you know brick and mortar architecture? I think we use a lot of virtual spaces to think about architecture and didn't have the chance to build something in my studio. So everything was uh, was in a way virtual in my studio. So and that wasn't something difficult uh, for me, mm -hmm. I think. Cool. Uh, there is a question from Arnaud in the chat. Um, so maybe Arnaud, do you want to ask it directly? Just need to unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. Hi. Yes. <laughs> Um, yes, my question. Thank you. First, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the for the for the presentation and, and uh, congratulations for the for the amazing work. Um, you said, uh, Nicola and Valentin, you you that you you tested for for three months. Uh, I was uh, curious uh, to know whether you you change anything during this uh, during this uh, test phase and 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 if yes what what did you change what what was the the amount of work and and maybe after that i have another question <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much perhaps we can let also roma colo he's the product manager he's just with us you, you can answer because we're uh, doing some uh, evolution but we we wait the test phase roma um, no actually because um, during our test, we needed to to have a chance to get a, a significant scientific results. That's why we ask uh, sixty uh, participants to to test exactly the same version, but uh, divided into two navigation systems, as uh, Valentin showed you before. And after that, only uh, we'll have the chance to adjust our design or uh, our design hypothesis depending on the the result. 
So uh, a new release is planned uh, by the end of the summer, uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. But we will use the uh, the results of the, of the test. Great. Uh, Arnaud, do you have a second question? Uh, so, so, so basically, if, if I understand correctly, you you uh, you built uh, you built the the or you built it all, and then you chose uh, between uh, variations uh, from from test from testing. Is that is that correct? Yes, but before uh, building it uh, like it is uh, uh, today, uh, I and Valentin made a lot of uh, iteration before. There are okay. some tests uh, run uh, last year and the year, be uh, the year before, and uh, everything is uh, built on uh, the previous uh, observations and the results. In, in fact, in our in our project, it's it's a big issue where we make you know that I would say the heavy test where we can have you know, really knowledge which is reliable and solid. If we do it too early, the version are not you know. Uh, um, far enough to make to provide something which is credible uh, but we have the flexibility to change what we want if we if we make it too late then we we cannot move on anything so, so <laughs> it, it's a big trap so where we were far enough and and but we we make tests before uh, we make tests after so we we have iteration but it's not you know scientific uh, uh test where we can republish with its uh, uh reliable knowledge um, so at a certain time point, we need to make this massive testing thing. It's where we get all the data for publication, but we perform tests before and after. Mm -hmm. This is great. Uh, I would like to uh, to ask a question. Uh, maybe it's for it's for Valentin or it's for Aptitude about the um, the whole technique behind it. Like I was really uh, when I discovered the platform. What's crazy if you look at the website is like. Uh, it, it looks like it's 3D, like the objects are coming out of the screen, but for real, if I understood well, it's just images. So maybe can you tell us a bit more how you did that? Uh, is there Jeremy, Jeremy here? Do you know if he... If he... No, I think he, he's, he's not connected at the moment, but I can uh, give uh, not a technical answer, but uh, part of the answer which is uh, basically we did think about the 3D, as you saw in the video that was presented, uh, we, we were trying some objects in 3D that are part of the collection. Our objects also had uh, um, that we needed to test the lighting on it. And um, we noticed uh, that it was not the right way to show the objects, all of them. So the idea is actually not 3D, <laughs> if I can uh, just summarize. Um, uh, we use the, um, as uh, Valentin said, we use all of the retrographic work, um, all of the lightning, all of the, um, the also the materiality part that was uh, uh, done by giving uh, weight to the object, for example, um, and the way the user uh, like kind of moves around the object. And this is the way that uh, we were able to give this impression of 3D, but in the same time, not necessarily doing a technical 3D object that has a, um, a general lightning. Mm -hmm. um, the idea was to, to be more, uh, more specific. Each um, object was better used with its own light. It didn't need uh, to have a, a fake light over it. So, so that was a, a, a big question when we were testing. And, uh, and I think the result uh, it's much better than having a uh, sort of some sort of fake illusion with 3D. So yeah. So the technology behind is WebGL or it's something else. Looking at the uh, source I... code, uh, I think it's uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the engineers are, are looking. It looks like yeah. CSS transform. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It, it was not WebGL. Is if my if I remember correctly, I'm not in the technical team, so I would I wouldn't be able to say it. But I think it's yeah, it, it's not necessarily a, a 3D. Mm -hmm. cool. It's really custom based. Yeah, no, but it, it's great because yeah, if it's just CSS transform, it's it's pretty simple when you think. But it's like the like the result is really really impressive. So uh, really, if you haven't done it yet, just look uh, in the chat. There is the link. Uh, it's called Expo. Uh, Starobinsky, uh, the TH, and look at the website. It's very, very imp impressive. I just wanted to know about the um, what were the inspirations because when you look at this website, it looks uh, very fresh and very new, which is not easy to do because pretty much like everything has been done already, right, uh, in the web. Uh, so how did you come up with these layouts and what were the inspirations between, uh, be uh, like uh, behind the design? I 
that all time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we try to use also the inspiration of the book, like these two pages when you have the, the book on your on your left and the text on your right. It really looks like a, a book with half half. And we think about also this room with different uh, like uh, objects as the, um, the island that you have in the museum. So this kind of spaces that uh, group different artifacts to establish uh, a part of the life of the, of, the, of the author. So I think it's between digital and also, uh, also um, uh, analogic. analogic, uh, analogic uh, right. Yeah, I, I, it, it's clearly what is the hardest to do because to make digital look like analog and that you can, you know, what I love also is that you can zoom in uh, really in the images. So I guess the resolution is crazy. How did you also pull that off from a performance port, uh, point of view? How do you have that big images and it's still quite fluid? Uh, actually, we have really bigger images that you can see. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the, 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 the source of the images is more than 100 uh, megabytes. So uh, aptitude find a way to like um, change the size of the document um, depending on the place you are in the exposition. Mm -hmm. Like when it's like small, you use a, a small, a smaller images, and when you are like getting closer, you use the better images. So it's you never have um, images that that are missing or that is missing, mm -hmm. but you have like uh, better and better and better images. So it's it make it a bit more fluid. Mm -hmm. Is it right? Is, is, <laughs> is it, it right? <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, I would say one thing that is often the case, we try to recreate, and that's always an envy, with the technology, we try to recreate in the digital world, the physical world exactly. And that's also what we witnessed when we were working on the Montreux Jazz Archive. Ah, we need to redo the concert as it was. And usually it's really a bad issue because it's always a bad copy. You never have the real book. So it's it's better to take into account the limitation to see what you can do technically and so to see how you go can go around, how you can make something which is specific to the, to the digital world with inspiration of the physical world. So that's, it's not trying just to mimic one-to-one -one the physical world, it's to understand what are some of the behavior and how you can translate it in a way that is specific to the digital world. And I think it's where you get really the, the strongest results. That's great. So um, maybe maybe this one is for Nicola. What is the future of this uh, exhibition? So we understood it's about one author. Well, already there is more than 40,000 documents, right, to, to expose. But what is the future of uh, this exhibition, knowing that probably the system or platform can be reused uh, or scaled up to different authors, maybe? So do you have plans for the future? Yes, sir. <laughs> so there's a bit less document in the in the exhibition, but, but we, we uh, compose more than 100,000 to, to make the exhibition. But, but basically, what we try to do is to have a system, and that's also why a research lab is, is here, is to have a system and understand the, the principle of how we can build this kind of exhibition. So the next step would be to test. So first, we'll make some improvement of the exhibition, uh, uh, version two, based on the results that we have. And the second thing is we will publish the, the results and say, now, what do we have learned? Because we, we think that we are the broadest people on earth and we have this word, but then perhaps it doesn't work like we think. So, so it's important to see now what is really working, what is not, and how, what people can also use for their own creation um, and so that we start to build you know, the knowledge around this. And then uh, uh, the, the goal is to see how it works with other authors. For sure, we, we, we thought uh, about this exhibition with Stephanie by so thinking to other authors and, and having a system that can work uh, with uh, other authors, but we need to test it again. It's when you test it that you see, oh, it's working in a different way that I expect that, or it's working perfectly well, or we have some trap, and that's really what, what we need to do. But again, to understand also the, the impact uh, uh, among the user. Great, great. Uh so I think that was the that was the, the last answer. Thank you so much, uh, Nicola and Valentin, to come to uh, to showcase this amazing work. Really, if you haven't uh, look at the website, look at it. Uh, it's so it's called three times w expo dash starobinsky.ch. Super super great uh, website. And really, thank you for coming uh, to speak uh, at Art Today Apero. Really great to discover uh, case studies. So if you guys who are watching, uh, you have some case studies you want to showcase your work, uh, whether it's uh, what you do uh, 
uh, on digital project, but it could be really totally different projects of innovation, or you want to talk about the way uh, the way your team works, don't hesitate to write us. And thank you so much, everyone, to uh, to uh, to show up today. Uh, I think yeah, uh, we can give a big round of applause for our speaker of today. <laughs> And see you soon for uh, a future I2D Apple. Thank you so much, everyone. Cheers.